What's up, freaks? This up, is freaks? this is the Russian and the freak. As we're waiting for Facebook to load up, this is the Russian and the freak episode number eleven. Today we're going to be talking about: Are you stuck in your past? Are you a boohoo, poor little me, my little fucked up childhood? I'm stuck in my past, my little shitty childhood. It's time to get over it. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about our own our own personal. Childhood, whatever you want to call, we have on all the different social medias all over over the place today. The Russian, no, the Russian, the who? The Russian. The Russian and the freak. We're gonna be a, a new kind of platform here. We're just gonna be discussing it. The the fucked up childhoods, the how it's affected us as a kid, how how it affects us if it does it all now as adults or semi adults or whatever the fuck you want to call it. And this is episode number eleven, and we're talking. You're right over there. <laughs> You're right. Yes. Are you sure? Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. You know how this show goes. Uh, By no. Now. What does that mean? Yes, everybody knows how it goes. If you have to say, you know how the show goes. That just ruins how the show goes. That's what. It doesn't even make about. sense. The rush and the freak <laughs> is how to maintain your equilibrium and function in this dysfunctional world as a freak family. In business and life, so you can transform your chaotic complexity into your own personal normalcy. This is how to win at business, how to win at life, at family, relationships, and how to just kick ass in all these real world situations. This is what we're talking about. This is shit you need to hear. This is no bullshit, just straightforward, telling it like it is and how it should be. Bringing the fucking fire every second of every second. Let's do this. So, we're talking about, what are we talking about today? I don't even know what we're talking about today. Well, we, first of all, I want to welcome everybody to the show and just just for your time because you're spending your time trying to find some lessons from this show and hopefully we're going to deliver to you. So thank you so much for showing up today and we would love for you guys to participate and even tag a person, uh, a friend of yours who think might relate to this. And I think everybody can relate to this You're supposed story. to say what the show so, is about. You're yes. asking them they might relate to it, but they don't even yes. know what the fuck you're talking yes. about. Yes, hold on. You, the you... Russian and the freak. One second. So this show today is all about how the childhood adversity, uh, how to really um, um, can propel you uh, in in your in your life. It, changing, really rewriting and changing your story. So all of us have some story about our childhood i believe that uh, we had good stories and bad stories and a lot of a lot of adults we've realized through coaching and through being in a business for many many years with uh, our peak physique uh, training locations and now coaching clients that people get stuck in the past and and it's hard for them to get out of it and we're talking about in in these platforms are of mind body and business and that's what we thought it's great idea to kind of discuss it on the show and show you that where we are today it took us obviously years and develop a character and certain things that we need to overcome because all of us had a story and steve will will tell you his story and i will share my story as well and today is actually a little bit different how we're gonna be oh how is it different this. who well, said we... i'm gonna share my story what, what is this all about well, what just... do you have there on the side there what the fuck is that <laughs> who remembers this i think Pete... where do you where do you, <laughs> where do you stick this thing what do you do with this <laughs> this is a microphone i've never even seen this before what, what do you do with this you talk through this. Look, this is what we used to do at Peak Physique Locations doing the interviews. And I'm sure that some of the clients will, will remember All right, well, this. Well, in getting ready for this show, you seem to think that this is like, or you're like Oprah interviewing someone. This ain't a fucking interview. You're not sitting. Put your little dildo away or whatever the hell it is. A freaking <laughs> golden dildo. Whatever the hell that thing is. Anyway, we're going to talk about how to stop. How to be, like, listen, here's the straightforward part about it. If you're... 30, 40, 50 years old, and you're still talking about shit that happened when you were a kid and as that as shit that happened as if it's still holding you back today, you need to put on your fucking big boy pants, grow the fuck up, and get over that shit. Like, it's time to get over that shit. It's time to move the fuck on. Like, you can only claim that shit for so long, the childhood bullshit for so long. 
just like you can, I, I interviewed, a, I had a, a session with a client one time in, in the gym for weight loss. And she wanted to lose whatever, 40, 50 pounds. And she said, well, you know, it's the baby weight. And you can understand that. They have a little baby weight. I'm like, oh, congratulations. How old is, how old is your kid? She's like 14. I'm like, oh, 14. So almost a year and a half. No, no, no. 14 years, she says. I said, listen, bitch, you can't claim baby weight on a kid that's 14 years old. Just like you can't claim this childhood shit. You're damn near 40, 50 years old. And, and it's still like, boo, fucking who, poor little me. Mommy and daddy didn't freaking pay, give me enough attention. And you let it affect you. And that's your excuse, your fucking excuse for living a miserable life. And even if you, if you have kids, now you're passing that bullshittery onto your kids. Like, it's time to get the fuck over that. And everyone has different levels of childhood fucked up in this or whatever you want to call it, trauma. But it's all the same thing. It's all the same. It affects them as they get older in the same way. So it's time to cut loose of that shit. So we have some cameras up here, some down here. So we're looking both different directions. And you have to use that stuff as a as a, a superpower, not a fucking crutch. Like you're using that as a ceiling to hold you right here. Like it's time to start bumping that fucking ceiling up. It's time to bump that, that ceiling up until it gets so high you can't even reach it, that it's out of reach. And eventually blow the fucking roof off that the ceiling doesn't even exist. Instead of letting that bullshit from when you were a kid like big deal. Like if you're talking about it, like we'll talk about stuff and we're going to talk about some some personal stories today about a childhood and whatever. Talking about it as in not oh poor me this happened to me. Talking about it as in thank god this happened to me. Like luckily I was in this situation as a kid because that made me where I am now today. So that's kind of the idea is you reframing shit, a different perspective on shit. And not letting it hold you back instead of using it as a weapon to propel you forward. Yes, awesome. So, Steve, if you could actually tell a little bit about your story, could you... What are you fucking... Why don't you plot your little dildo while you're at it? Think, you think it. this is an interview? You think you're here for an interview? <laughs> what do you want to know? Well, a little bit about maybe your story. I, I thought mean, this was supposed people... to be like seeing a cross. You're damn near sitting on my lap. I would like that right there. So what is it? What is it that you need? So a little bit about your story. I mean, a lot, a lot of times you say about your childhood and your story in, in, in Steve says, but some people will be coming on the first time and maybe they never heard your story. So what story? What is that? Well, that's a, that's a very well, vague question. What's your story? Well, let's start with, uh, with how you were growing up, maybe. As in, that's uh, that's like thirty years worth. Where would you like to talk about? No, well, the first few years of. of I don't fucking remember the first few years well, when I was two years old. Maybe I don't know. I was probably shitting all over the place. <laughs> probably learned to say my private first word out of my mouth was "fuck." I'm guessing, maybe bullshit or something like that because that's a little easier. But so g- growing up, whatever, and everything, all the stories we're telling today are to give you examples of what you can do and go through. And, and sure, many people have it much worse. Like I grew up as a ghost, a little fucking ghost, as in zero attention. And that's fine. And I like it because that gave me superpowers. Instead of saying, oh, now I'm going to be an adult and be a ghost. It gives me a superpower to be able to, if I have to be by myself in, in a office or in a hotel room for six, seven hours to just sit and grind and work and get some shit done. I don't have to go run around and do all this other stuff. I have that superpower that I could sit and focus and be totally fine by myself and make shit happen. Like I'll build a fucking business in a day or two with that superpower that I got from being ignored when I was a kid. So luckily that happened to me. And my best friend when I was a kid was the wall, the side of the house. I would throw the baseball against the wall, a nine inning ball a game. I would pitch it and throw it. It'd be like strike one, strike two, literally nine innings, three outs an inning. And I would do that every, all the time. That was like, and I was, I would sometimes lose the game. That's pretty fucking pathetic when you lose a game against a wall. And I would lose it because if you throw it too hard, it was a fence, it bounced over, it was a home run. I'd keep the score. I'd know the pitches. I'd know with the, the different players that were up at bat. They'd hit home runs. Sometimes I would cheat and make myself win. But sometimes I'd lose to a fucking wall. But that was the best friend was a wall. And as much as a ghost as I felt, I would wear a Zorro mask probably until I was four or five. So I went to kindergarten probably. I went to kindergarten when I was four. I wore a Zorro mask all around town because I thought that if people, if I had that on, people couldn't see me. They wouldn't know who I was. 
because I figure I'm a ghost at home. I might as well just be a ghost everywhere. But that people just look at me like I was a fucking weirdo because I'd be running around the park. I can't imagine why no one wanted to play with me in the park. And no one still wants to play with me. I go to the playground now and all the little kids run away from me. I don't know what the fuck's up with that. I'm like, no, I'm not wearing the Zorro mask. Let's play. And I'm fucking running around them like a garden gnome chasing them around through the little, the, the, the playground shit. And they're running from me. But I don't know. And then the cops come and I run and they think I'm a creep or something. But anyway, that's besides the point. Yes. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. So, uh, look, it's, it's, it looks like it's difficult, right? When you hear this story, like crazy story, and I'm sure you have uh, some kind of story to tell us and share with us. And my childhood, I, w- I was growing up without a father. And just recently, I even shared this on uh, one of my Instagram feed stories, how uh, it affected me growing up. But then yet at the same time, being raised without the father, I had a loving family of my grandparents and 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 my mom. But the part of not having the father affected me later on in life because he just pretty much showed up in my life out of nowhere and it almost gave me a hope like he can he will he will show up he will be there for me right in all these uh all these um moments of my life but that was for a short moment and then he disappeared so uh just to tell you how it all started left my mom when she was still pregnant with me and she had a hard time coping this throughout her life and i think on a subconscious level gave that to me that fear of maybe relationship of commitment and other things and I had to overcome this to become uh, I would say more responsible of my own uh, life and being the best mom that I can be and create the most awesome relationship so so that that would be on my end and uh, what else what else, what else we have we, we have you're the say. one with the fucking interview so supposedly yes so guys is there anything that you would like to share and comments with us today we would love to now i see some of you are showing up coming on and so i always think about it what's worth like people that people say they grew up without a father and then people that grew up with a father who beats them or they grow up in a house and they're sexually assaulted or whatever. I was never sexually nothing, whatever. I did look at my first porno magazines when I was like four years old. I stole them from my brother. Those are some stories. Freaking four years old. He left for the Marines at 17. He came to the room. He's like, give me my magazines back when he was leaving for the Marines. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. So at the time I was seven. I already had them for years. And he's like, give me my magazines back. And I, I applied to play dumb. He's like, I know you have them. I'm not stupid. So I gave him them and there was like, I don't know, five or six that I stole from him. And he takes them and he throws one or two back to me for me to keep at seven years old. And that was after I already had them for a year. So I don't know, maybe that explains a lot. I don't know. The porno collection at, at lo- younger than seven. I don't even know when I, we, where we first found those things. But that that's, I always wonder what was worse, not having a, someone that doesn't have a father or someone who has a father who is just ignoring them, neglecting them, beating them, abusing them. Like I was a ghost. I lived in the house until I was 19 years old and never had a real conversation, a single conversation with my father. I never sat on the floor and played Legos or played with little fucking G.I. Joes or whatever. Nothing. Not a single time. Never threw a ball. A ball. Like a catch. Ever. Or at least as far as I can remember. So then it's like, I'm a kid. I'm like, all right, someone beat me or someone do something horrible to me. Someone touched me in a funny place because at least then I wouldn't be a ghost. That's where you start. So I wonder what's different. And it's probably the same kind of when you get older, you probably have the same whatever in your own fucked up in this head from either way. But I wonder what it is because she didn't have a father. I my father was there, but was a I was a ghost. So it's almost very similar. But some of them, it's there. Some of it's not. And then we get older and I talk to men about the project all the time. And, and almost every call, it's something back to childhood that's holding grown fucking men back. To be, and these are sometimes fairly successful, sometimes dead broke. Sometimes they're with kids, sometimes out kids, sometimes married, sometimes not married. But just imagine that a married fucking dude with kids, semi successful, but not thriving, and sitting there still at 30, 40, 50 years old, still talking about the fucking childhood shit 
that's holding him back from being the man that he's supposed to be. Imagine where the, the direction those kids are going to go if you don't get your fucking shit together and get over the sh- that shit. Learn, again, how to reframe that stuff. How to reframe being the ghost into being an entrepreneur. That's the way I saw it. Like I was getting entrepreneur lessons because that's what it takes to be an entrepreneur is to sit up late nights by yourself, no one there to help you, figuring shit out, all alone, in the dark, pulling all-nighters, and that's what happens when you're alone at home and you're a ghost and you have no friends. You don't go to sleep. You just sit there. I would sit up till 3, 4, 5, 6 in the morning as a kid just thinking of different ways I could make money so I could go buy some fucking Twinkies because we wanted some food because we didn't have any fucking food. We had, we, we'd get the, the church would bring over food, cans of like government food, the big block of government cheese. That cheese was fucking good. I want to see if we can get some. See if we can order some government cheese. Hold on, talking about this cheese, this was like a, was it like a, a block log, of cheese? Like was it like a orange rectangle, color? Of course. So this shit was fucking good. Can, can you imagine, guys, that exactly the same thing was going on in Poland years ago? Because uh, I grew up in Poland and the churches would distribute these block of orange cheese to poor families. And here we are at the same time, Steve here in America received the same help. We haven't received the help, but when I used to go to the church, we would see these block of cheese. And and till actually he told me the story till that day, I couldn't comprehend this whole thing. Like how come like these big cheese comes from America to these families. But as he mentioned, like he grew up with a father, but kind of without and me completely out. He showed up when I was seven years old. I remember like today he moved to Germany and I remember I was living at that time with my grandparents and my mom's first he sent a package to me it was like a beautiful package with a beautiful things for school and I was just like barely seven years old and he pulled with the Audi I remember a, a nice like color light blue color car and he showed up for the first time and I remember me and my mom was talking to him outside and then I had a moment of of maybe like an hour to talk to him and that was it so him what i've realized through my life that missing him he was replaced by my grandfather he was there to my grandfather was there because i was raised by them with my mom in the same household grandpa was like taking really leading a position of almost being like my father, teaching me how to ice skate, teaching me how to uh, ride a bike, teaching me how to play soccer. Uh, you know, we would go on amazing trips with the family and grandpa had that role, but it's still, you probably, like, if you know what I mean, like the father role should be, the father should be there, right? But grandpa was trying to help as much as he could and he did a fantastic job. And I'm forever grateful today is what, he's 90, 93 years old and still, I am able to talk to him and just recently was telling him how grateful I am for all these things that he did with grandma. So imagine if you didn't have a positive male role model because all kids need a positive male role model. That's why I do the show with the kids breaking the cycle because you need both ends of it. You need a, uh, they obviously a father and mother, the kids that don't have a positive male role model and then they don't have a grandparent, a grandfather either. And you know, grandfather, a little sometimes old and fucking out of touch. And that's not the same as a uh, father, but at least it's something. But imagine if you didn't have a, you definitely would have been like some Russian mail order bride or some like stripper, Russian stripper mail. or some shit. Cause I've seen the fucking high heels that you wear. So you're just, you were just one wrong little, one little twitch away from like straight up. I don't know. I have to tell you, this is your super special power. Like turning this into something you, you don't know when it's coming. And it just came, just arrived about me and the heels. It's really freaking funny. But yes, I, w- I am so grateful that I had it. But Steve, deep inside, at some point it affected me. This man, let me tell you, my father, it, it, I, I'm not the only one that is there. There is my sister who is a few years older than me. So he didn't actually even raise this this daughter. He left his family to be with another one, was with my mom for like a year, left, and then apparently we found another sister in there. So he was he wasn't committed, uh, he wasn't committed as a superhero, he wasn't committed father. But he it affected me because if Deep inside, I was feeling, okay, why, why, why is he not there as a child? Why is he not showing up? Why he's not supportive? Why he, why he doesn't love me, right? Why he doesn't love me? And hold on. And, (laughs) and those questions, I'm sure that so many people have it. 
Don't, don't you, I don't know where she going with this. I got some ideas. Yes, but that's what it is. And it let kind of throughout. I understand there's like the Corona and all that and there's travel restrictions, but there's no fucking way in hell that when your mother was visiting this country that she shouldn't, couldn't get back. It took nine months to get back to Poland. That's fucking bullshit. That's what I'm just saying. For some reason, whatever you're saying, just sparked that in my head. I don't know how those are connected, but obviously there's some fucking neural pathway connection from what you were just saying to your mother being here for a three for a three week trip, turning into nine and a half fucking months. Okay, like, you'll edit some. There's months. no way that there, it's that hard. Like I guarantee, it, 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 every time it was oh the flights got canceled. Oh you need this and that. I guarantee there was a way to do it because we had guys come from the project that came from fucking South Africa, that came from Canada, that came from Mexico, but somehow. She couldn't get back to Lots fucking... Polish somehow airlines. she couldn't get back to Russia in in, in that amount of time. Lots Polish airline wasn't flying. Bull, but. I, I'm calling bullshit on this. Anyway, somehow that story, I don't know how. You figure <laughs> out how you connect those dots about what you were saying, how that made that story pop in my head. You you figure that one out. Uh, maybe later. But, but, but guys, it caused me... This stuff caused me to really spiral out of control at some point of my life. At and some, at some point. He thinks that it still continues. When is it? Maybe. <laughs> has it ended? Has it stopped? Has the spiral tornado but, fucking stopped? But yet? it's different way now. It's different way. Like I use my superpower. Even I created the superhero costume of the a superpower. Family. Setting up for this show to set up the the light. You're unplugging it from the wall to turn a device on. How is unplugging something from the wall going to turn it on? Explain. No, this is definite fucking Polish mathematics. It is. It it is. But you know. What is two? How many? February, March, April, May, June. It wasn't nine months before five months. And the trip. Are you of my changing mom. the subject about <laughs> turning on out. the light? Anyway, guys. So uh, just just to uh, just to bring it up a little bit m- more, uh, things that happened in my life, how it affected me. Imagine, um, imagine being thirteen year old. We moved out from our uh, from my grandparents' house. My mom got an apartment, and we moved into the apartment and a few years later i remember like today i was doing my homework i was doing math and look how events like significant events in your life made such an imprint in you that you remember every single thing about it it's so crazy so i'm doing the math and there is a doorbell and math? What kind of math? Like actual on. math? Like math. I was doing a homework. Math homework. I oh, remember that, sitting at my... Math at my... homework in Poland. That, would, that might have been... That must have been entertaining. Anyway, continue. Okay. okay. And there is a doorbell. And I opened the door. And I remember my mom has like a double door in Poland. Because they used to install the double doors. <laughs> because of the robbers. Ain't no one breaking like... into that house. <laughs> the fuck are they going to steal? The little nine-inch black and white television? What the fuck? With the rabbit ears on top? I don't know. But and the tinfoil to... attached to get reception for the uh, propaganda news but, and network? Yes, but I have what to open this What the fuck is someone going to steal from that place? Open one, and there is the other door, and there's this man standing there, and my heart went up to my throat, and I felt like squeeze, and then there is a girl standing next to him, Okay. And I realized that this is my father and he's like, can we come in? And I remember that he was walking in and in my head, I'm thinking, oh my God, he bring, he brought his, his, uh, his second wife or something. How dare he actually showing up with this girl in my house? Wait a second. Later on, what I've realized, because they sit down on the couch, we have a talk that this is my sister. This is not his wife. This is not his fiance. This is my sister who I never met in my life. That was my first sister that he just decided to show up. So look how just, 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 just to comprehend this story, just to try to understand is just chaotic. It's just like showing up after promising me that he never, he's never going to come for, uh, he's he, he showing up at, when I was seven years old. Then not showing up as he's promised, and then out of nowhere, just showing up at, at the house, bringing my sister there, and and that was it for a few years. So this was such a significant. I I, I remember 
incident almost it didn't feel right and i remember for days after i felt just so uncomfortable and like he caught kind of like spiral my peace because i had a peace and i was living without him and, and again she showed up and create this whole spiral chaos. my peace that should yeah. be a t-shirt spiral my peace but he he created like a tornado that's how i felt that it was that peace that i had and out of nowhere he showed up and for what what was the reason for him but luckily up? these things happen because when we run the project there's of course the guys that have their fucked up trauma but every class there's always a few two or three men who are there and you know why they're there not because they had a fucked up childhood, because they had a perfect, smooth, normal, average childhood. And, and people like that are fucked up as adults just as much or even more than the kids that had a fucking hard life. Think about it. Because they don't know how to deal with shit. So they grow up and they're adults and then the world is fucking sideways and people are stabbing them back to getting into the business world, into entrepreneurship and dealing with people and problems and fucked up shit out in the world. They don't know how to deal with it and they lose their shit and they go fucking crazy because they don't know how to deal with it. So it's all again about reframing this stuff to think, luckily that I had this fucked up thing. Luckily my father did this. Luckily my father left. Luckily he showed up there and made me feel all fucking weird. So you learn how to deal with these situations. So when you get older and shit goes fucking sideways, you're ready for it and, and shit happens and and craziness comes lock, knocking on your door. It's like, oh, this again. I'm ready for it. And you don't lose your shit at 40 years old like you see some fucking adults doing. And some idiots on the fucking social medias acting like fools, acting like teenagers. Like, because they didn't learn how to either. They either never had that. It's like a disservice to not have a tough childhood. That's why I, like, I, I think it's almost every successful person you see, almost every entrepreneur you see, most millionaires you see, you see they came to this country with what? Like $10 in their pocket. Or they were homeless. They were eating out of dumpsters. They were whatever. You hear it all the time, like a good percentage of it. And it's because of that. There's a story about two twin brothers. One's a millionaire and one's a homeless fucking crackhead. They asked the homeless crackhead, hey, how'd you become a homeless crackhead? He said, well, my father was a drunk. He was a drug addict. He neglected me. He beat me. I had a horrible childhood. And that's why I became a homeless crackhead. They asked his twin brother, the millionaire, like, how'd you become a millionaire? He says, well, my father was a drunk, a drug addict. He neglected me. He beat me. And that's why I became a millionaire. It's all about, and one of your Oprah questions was that you had as we're looking. I don't know where the fuck your Oprah questions are. You, you thought you were fucking coming here to interview me or something. And he said, no, I'm not answering your questions. So I said, okay, we're just going to do it as it is. And we're just going to flow with what we have. It was something about the trigger or no, not the trigger. What made you, I don't remember the fucking question. But they're all What here, made you switch? What made you change or? Yeah, the or, breakthrough or, or some kind of a breakthrough or what caused you to like break the pattern, like break what happened in you because it, you, you bounce off whatever you, take, you have. You take the, 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 the fucked up hat, like someone that's a drunk or a drug addict or they're addicted, they have an addiction. They're fucking hard-headed. They're stubborn. Whatever it is in their DNA. You have some of that DNA in you. Take that DNA and learn how to use it in a different direction. I have stubbornness in the DNA. That's what I came up with. Because who's, what makes the difference between those two twin brothers? One of them was just stubborn. He said, you know what? And that's what I did. I looked at my father when I was a kid. And I, and I said, when I, I'm going to be nothing like that fucking man when I grow up. I'm going to study every little thing he does. And that's a superpower. That makes me from being the, a shitty childhood with a shitty father and taught me by the shittiness of that, taught me exactly how to be the exact opposite to try to at least be a decent super father to my kids, which I try to be and I try to get better every day. And those little kids are fucking maniacs. They piss me off sometimes, but we have fun and we have a great relationship and we talk about real stuff and we have a good time all the time and spend more time together than anyone I know. And it's a stubbornness. It comes down to being fucking hungry and stubborn, like hungry literally and figuratively, like hungry. Hungry like I was fucking starving as a kid. Like I got caught stealing for the first time when I was three years old. I caught, st stole chocolate. Who steals at three years old? Well, because we didn't have any food and I wanted some fucking chocolate. I never had, we don't get chocolate. We didn't get treats. We didn't get desserts. Imagine little Steve. So I'm in a grocery store. Three That's years the old. craziest thing. Walking around the store by myself at three years old. That's what you do in the grocery store. And they had those little one cent candies and the real chunky ones were two cents. 
and you would take the candies. You had to put your one cent or two cent in the little jar. It was just like a trust system on the I candies. I don't remember because I wasn't raised here. They're so like in I these twisty know. little chunk things in the Grand Union in Suffolk, New York. Now it's OTB, the off track betting. It used to be Grand Union. We would walk there. So I took the chocolate. I ate it. I went to my mother and I said, Hey, do I have anything on my face? She's like, What? I'm like, I don't know, like chocolate or anything. She's like, No, why? I'm like, oh, no, never mind. And she got it out of me that I stole chocolate. She made me go to the store manager and give him his fucking two cents. I had to give him two pennies and apologize to him for it. And I, and I thought in my head, I said, hmm, if I didn't ask about it, I could have got away with it. So next time I went, I ate 10 fucking chocolates and I didn't ask anyone nothing. It was delicious. So I owe that motherfucker 20 cents. She's going to watch the story later. She's going to ask you to go there and return the money. She's going to go there to OTB. <laughs> she's, gonna... she's so crazy. She's so whack. She will go to OTB where it is and she'll pay them 20 cents. Grandma Even though go. it's a different place. She'll go there and pay them 20 cents just out of the, out of the principle of it. But it's because I was fucking starving. I was hungry. I was hungry for life. I was hungry for fucking chocolate. So hungry for food, but hungry for life. So hunger plus stubbornness will make you become that fucking millionaire. The lack of that stubbornness will make you become that fucking crackhead and just give into it and, oh, poor me. This is the way it is. Let me just go along with it. That's just the way life, life's supposed to be hard. Life's supposed to be fucked up. Boo fucking who, poor little me. Like fucking Eeyore from, from what's his fucking cartoon? Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh. Oh, poor me. No, but that's Life's right. supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be difficult. If it's not hard and it's not life, like it's supposed to be miserable. It's supposed, life's a grind, like... You can learn a lot about someone by asking them the question, life is a, and we're talking about that with the kids next week, so we don't want to spoil that, but ask yourself that question and just answer. What's the first word that comes to mind? Life is a uh, what? And finish. We did that at, I don't even at know the what gym. Oh my God. I don't know. Is, but yours was probably kielbasa or some shit or vodka. Vodka, I bet. No, life is a journey I put it in. Somebody put yellow. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this is a cool thing. Ask your spouse, what do you think the life is? And let them finish. But that's true. Steve is very stubborn. And well, he, Hold on. I could say it about myself. Don't go fucking jumping no, no, on the no, shit no, that no, I'm but, saying just to but talk this was shit. Good. No, no, no. But th just that's the good shit. thing. I just want to say good thing. I always to say good things. I try to catch the good things. Because I remember when we opened up Peak Physique in... In in uh, in Spring Valley, our first location, and we were like three months behind the rent because we were great coaches, but very poor entrepreneurs. We did not have any marketing skills, and we decided to open up the gym based on how great we were as coaches. So look how these decisions you make in your life, thinking, okay, I can go and do this because I have my clients or I have followers or I am the best coach and the ego takes over and it's great. I mean, it's great that we did that, but then the obstacles come and if, if he wasn't uh, stubborn enough and, um, and, and focused and like resourceful and like being like, we're going to figure this out. We would have never made it, but he, st he was, listen, he would work. Like, I don't know how many hours. I remember going to Spring Valley, being there at nighttime, and he would sit down and, and search and research and trying to find out ways to make this happen. And once he figured this out, we were able to jump over the obstacle, cross over the obstacle. So for those of you who are struggling right now, there is always away and think i think like the obstacles are made always there for a reason they freaking testing you it's like a test in your life to see okay are you gonna freaking do this are you strong enough to make this happen are you strong enough to make shit happen or are you gonna be like wiped out and you have no chances and that's what we did and that's how we succeeded because we grew this gym and then we open up nine wet and then eventually we open up suffering which wasn't the best idea uh, to do it but we we did it anyway and i i and i saw in, story, in story philosophy they say it's something like the obstacle is something about the path to success that the obstacle is the path the obstacle is the way to the success like you can't get there you can't have any success any fucking money any victory any nothing no level of success without a high level a significant level of obstacles roadblocks suffering pain hardship adversity like that's what makes it success and if and if you don't even have that what's the fucking point who even wants that like that easy life is fucking miserable easy as average easy as ordinary you don't not that you want to be in a struggle all the time like that eeyore motherfucker but you, <laughs> you want to have those obstacles that are a challenge to you that you can freaking overcome 
And that's what it's all about. Taking the obstacles from being a kid and learning how to use them as a, a weapon to propel you forward as an adult. Not using them as a fucking bullshit excuse. It's pathetic. It's pathetic. It's not even... It's just pathetic. That's the only word that I can say. But some things do stick with you when you're older from being a kid. And some things are even harder to get rid of than others. Whether they're habits or one of your Oprah questions were, what do you have leftover triggers? So I'm going to ask your Oprah question. What leftover triggers do you have other than fucking spiraling like a tornado and having pulling, going to, to turn the TV on, you rip, run around and rip the plug out of the fucking wall. Other than that trigger that apparently he, the, 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 the spiral to your piece made you unplug TVs to turn them on. And this isn't, we're not talking about childhood. We're talking about fucking 10 minutes ago is what we're talking about. Like getting ready for the show to get the monitors up and to try to figure out how to turn it on. Because, you know, every other TV in the house, what do you do? You pick up the remote control and you go click. But for some reason, since it's it's we're getting ready for a show and it's a little uh, whatever, maybe I got to go behind the TV and start fiddling around wires I've never touched before, start ripping shit out of the TV. And if that didn't work, let me go rip the plug out of the wall. So now the plug is no longer plugged into the TV and it's no longer plugged into the wall. Maybe that'll work in Poland, but it don't fucking work here. You could also use this thing that was sitting right on the counter. It's called a remote control. It's this new invention that came out in 1988. <laughs> it's fucking amazing. Amazing imagine? piece of alien technology. I did not see this, but... Be, anyway, so what's the triggers it. other than spiraling out of control? What are the other things that are still stuck with you? From Well, well I, I have to tell you, I triggers, I, I've... I've had to really go deep and, and think, would have to think about it. The triggers. I, I'm sure that they... Listen. listen the, uh, they let me teach are, you something about being are, an interviewer. Let me teach you something about being an interviewer. They, you're, you they, can't come up with your fucking Oprah questions and not be prepared to answer the same question yourself. That's fucking horrible interviewing. You're probably right. I'm not the... So you set up your little fucking questions, your little Dr. Phil questions that you're going to ask me about the triggers and all the stubborn and all this other stuff and don't even have don't even have a fucking answer yourself. That's right. Lesson motherfucking learned. I'll tell you one trigger, and this is a bad one. This is a deep one to the bone, to the deepest parts of my fucking DNA, and it doesn't get any more serious than this. Oh, I know that one, I think. When I'm sitting there and eating dinner, I cannot stand a motherfucker who chews and chomps with their motherfucking mouth open like they're a fucking camel yawning while they're chewing their food. It's fucking horrible, and it's disgusting. And it really makes me want to take a fork and jam it in your eyeball. Oh, God. Like, that's... No, that's a true story. Fork in the eyeball. So, the and the reason why it's all tied together. The fork. The, the triggers. My father would sit there and grumble and grunt. And, mm, 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 the, the, <laughs> the once every, like, seven, eight months that we would actually be at a table eating food. Like, maybe for a holiday or something. Because we wouldn't eat dinner together, really, ever. Because we wouldn't... We'd only eat dinner one or two nights a week. And if we did, it was some nasty fucking food you had to make on your own. And it was like cheese just slopped inside some bread. And if you had some honey, you'd put on it with the cheese and make whatever fucking concoction you can. But the once every like seven, eight months we'd have dinner, it'd be, oh my, it's to the bone. And one time that was going on while I was getting harassed about something, I don't know, and some drunken rage from my father while he's, while the chomping going on. Imagine this, the chomping going on, talking to you in a drunken slur, talking shit to you. I don't even remember about what, but just pushing you to the edge that literally one time, the chomping put me over the edge that I jumped up on top of the table, ran across the table, and I must have been, I don't know, 12, 13, 14, old enough to be semi-capable, and pushed my father against a wall and put a fork up to him that I was going to fucking stab him with the fork. Because you can only push a kid like getting... Pushed and t so much shit talked to you and the chomping. I could handle the shit talking, but when you're mixing the shit talking, I can handle the drunk, I can handle the throwing your steel toe work boots at me because it made me fucking quick and fast. That's where I got my speed from. Between dodging steel toe work boots and running from the cops, I got fucking fast. That's where I got running from. I never practiced running. I ran from the cops, jumping on rooftops and dodging steel toe work boots from drunk men. But I could handle the steel toe work boots. I could handle the drunk fucking idiots. I can handle the shit talking. Of course, those will push you enough. No, but those are triggers for you too. You but you to add that on top with the chomping. Now, that's when you've taken it too motherfucking far when you start chomping your food. I will stab you with a fork. He's getting angry. Don't chomp your food. Forks will come your way. And this goes to this day. 
these kids, when you see them chomp when they're eating. And we eat dinner together, unless I'm away at the project or traveling or something, or she has an emergency fucking toenail appointment or some shit. <laughs> we eat dinner together. That's what happened. Eat dinner together at the table. Sometimes we'll eat on a couch in one of our rooms that are specifically designated for eating and movies when we decide to once in a while to watch something while we're eating. We eat together seven days a week, which as a kid, that never happened. So not eating together as a kid taught me how to eat together as a kid. It's like fucking brilliant. It's like the playbook. I got the playbook on how to be a parent and how to live a life on how not to do it. I took it. Oh, check. That's how you did it. I know to do it the opposite. Thank you. Like, thank God these things happened to you. No matter what it is, no matter how bad it is. And I understand some people's lives are more fucked up than others. Boo-hoo for me. I fucking, no one talked to me when I was a kid. It could have been a lot worse, right? Or I got boot, work boots thrown at me. Or dealt with a fucking drunk father all the time. Imagine Little League. You're batting at Little League. And the only reason you're on the team is because the coaches paid for you to get on. Because you didn't have money. Your parents wouldn't pay the $37 to join the league. Because that would just be way too fucking much. Because they have to use that to go spend and, and go gambling on. The, the, the other kids' parents paid for you to be on the team. Because they know you're halfway decent. And you're batting. And so you're here. Kids pitching to you. You're trying to focus. And baseball is a pretty tough sport. To hit a ball that's coming in. You don't know where it's going to be. You don't know if it's going to be fast, slow. The catcher's right there mumbling to you. The umpire's behind him. You know who's behind the umpire? Behind that cage? A drunk dude standing there smoking a lucky strike holding a Budweiser beer with a white wife beater with cement stains on him that he came back from work drunk as fuck yelling at the umpire. He got kicked out of... He got banned from almost every baseball field we were at. I think that's why I stopped playing baseball because I couldn't deal with that anymore. But anyway, I don't know what the point of that was. I don't know where we were going with that. But anyway, let's let's keep going. So then what caused you to break the cycle? Because that's what we talk about with the kids is breaking the cycle. What caused to break the cycle? And it probably really never completely was broken until Tyson probably was born, I guess. It probably started before that. It really started when I, in 1986 is when I first noticed it. 1986. So that means I was nine. How old was I in 1986? Well, you were born in 77, right? 86. So I was nine. That's when I started to notice. I mean, I already noticed that things, something was a little off. That this wasn't the life that you're supposed to live. We were big Mets fans in our house. Huge Mets fans. Baseball. We watched, I watched every game as a kid. When I would pitch and get play against the wall, I'd be the Mets. We'd be playing against the Red Sox. In 1986, the Mets played the Red Sox for the World Series. The Mets were down in game six. They're about to lose the championship. This is a championship game. One more out, the Mets lose, and they don't win the championship. They go home losers, and the Red Sox win the World Series. The ball gets hit to first base. Keith Hernandez hits it. Mookie Wilson's on like second That's base. That's a memory. Oh, my God. Right the there. The ball gets hit to first base. A simple ground ball. All the first base has to do is pick up the ball. It's rolling right to his glove. Bill Buckner, pick it up and step his foot on first base, and the Mets are out of the championship. We're sitting there. We're all devastated because our team, we were big into baseball. Me and my brother and my father were watching this game. And we're sitting there. The ball goes to Bill Buckner's legs. We all jump up on our feet. Me and my brother are ready to fucking cry. My father jumps up and I'm noticing he's looking a little excited. I'm like, what the fuck? Because we thought the guy, he's going to be out. The ball goes to Bill Buckner's legs. Mookie Wilson comes around third base and comes around to score. And the Mets win the game. Me and my brother are going crazy. The drunk father goes storming out of the house, pissed off. I'm like, what the fuck? Our team won. It's like a miracle that we won and we did, we're winning the championship. They went on to win game seven and won the World Series in 1986. He stormed out because he was a drunk and a gambler. And he actually bet against the Mets. Like the team that we would live and die for. So who knows how much he went. We didn't eat ever. So he probably bet our dinner money on the team that we lived and died for. He bet against and lost money. At least this is the, the story I, I was told. I don't know how much this is what I, as far as I know the story. Maybe it's off and That's I don't know. Crazy. So then I said, wait a minute. You would bet against your own fucking team? Like I'm ready to cry that my team is losing. That made me start hating sports. That made me realize that I just, I'm going to think things, think about things a little bit differently. And then of course you still are living miserable to that time. And then once the kid is born, it's like, all right it's time to break the motherfucking cycle or else I'm going to create another little rotten bastard like myself. So I need to flip the switch and turn things around. Let me start taking notes on the lessons I learned through all these fucking years and do things the opposite way. Never eat dinner together. Okay. Always eat dinner together. Never go to practice and show up drunk. Okay. Always go to practice. That's why today, once we're done with this, I'm driving the kids over to jujitsu and I'll sit there 
And with them doing jujitsu on Friday night. That's what we do. That's our thing. Anyway, I don't know where we're going with all that, but oh, that, oh, was, that like was the, the breaking, breaking, breaking the cycle, breaking the cycle is and the stubbornness is the D in the DNA. That's the only thing I can come up with. Like what makes someone who has a crackhead mother? They uh-huh. grow up and they become a crackhead, but then someone else has a crackhead mother and they grow up to become a drug counselor or a millionaire. Like what is it that it has to be something in their DNA? A, 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 so they have the same addictive, psychotic, whatever personality a DNA drop from their parents but in the transmission of it must have got tweaked to like make it more stubborn and say no fuck that I'm gonna go the opposite of that because how does some people do it and some people don't there's no way I can come up with it of what it is other than some drop in their DNA who did you get the stubbornness from you think was it he's a stubborn fucking old crusty fuck guy had lung cancer and was out walked out of the hospital after they took a chunk of his lung out yeah that's true. He walked out of the hospital like two days later. So that's the only thing he gave me. He gave me these skinny bones, chicken legs, and an immune system from hell. Or not from hell, like a, a fucking iron immune system. It is. It's not normal. It's absolutely not normal. So you get some good stuff from that. <laughs> on that side, on the family. But anyway, guys, really looking at your story and and... And thinking, okay, not being stuck in the victimhood, uh, you know, if obviously if you need to look for and search for help, uh, because this is just a session telling you our story and how we overcome it and how it affected our life and how it has changed us. But just really trying to rewrite that story and thinking, okay, this was bad, but I can create my own vision. And by doing, creating better vision and doing, taking steps going forward to, to create this visionary reality, because otherwise, like if you are stuck in this negativity and maybe you have not good people around you, it will be very hard for you to overcome it and create a better future for yourself. And, and really in all areas of your life, like your, your mind, your body, and even your business. And it's never too late. You're that 40, 50 year old still fucking crying about mommy and daddy. All it takes, you know what all it takes? Fucking decide to fucking change direction, to break the cycle, to be the stubborn one. Just a decision. That's it. There's no secret to it. A fucking decision. Make a decision. I'm not going to be the same. I'm going to be fucking successful. I'm not going to be broke. I'm going to go make some money. I'm going to go come up. I'm going to go. I'm not going to go have a regular job. I'm going to go start a fucking business. I'm not going to be living in safe and comfort. I'm going to go do some wild, crazy, bold moves and take some fucking risks. Like all it takes, all those things are just decisions. You fucking decide. You decide you're going to be fat or fit. You decide you're going to be broke or rich. You decide if you're going to be a shitty parent or a good parent. All it takes is you deciding it. Like really think about it. No matter how fucked up you... It's just in your fucking head. Like you could just say, all right, I'm done being like that. Done. Done. No matter what it is, no matter what the habit is or the fucking weakness or the vice or the bullshit you tell yourself in your head. It takes a fucking decision in your head and it's done. It is as easy as that. It's simple as it sounds. You go, oh, it's not that easy. Yes, it fucking is. You just don't want to make it that easy. You want to just have the easy, the the, the fucking easy way out, easy answer of just a, a mediocre, an average, whatever. But the point is we can sit here and just talk about stories all day. So share some of your stories, send a message out about some of your stories. How, what have you used from your childhood to propel you forward to success and overcome and to be the stubborn one to break the cycle in your family tree, to take things in a whole different fucking direction. Share that with us because we got to get rolling because I need to go fuel up. Yes. And just, just to mention again, um, if you are a man, you should enter the project because those are things that Steve mentioned earlier that you can actually break the cycle during the project. So Steve will be able to tell you more because he's the instructor of the project and uh, and sign up to become a better man, better father, better husband. And if the project isn't for you or timing doesn't work or you need additional help in your discipline, additional help in overcoming these bullshit stories you need in, you have in your head with your mind, mind, your mindset, your confidence, your discipline, your structure, your energy, becoming an action taker and stop hesitating and procrastinating to kill the inner bitch in your head, kill those inner voices of fear, of doubt, of procrastination, of hesitation to finally step up and start making shit happen. Let's also talk, we could also talk about if one-on-one operate to dominate private coaching is for you also. We both do that for men and women. So if you need some help in any of these areas, let's jump on the phone 
and it can't hurt for us to have a conversation about it and see how we can help you. Hopefully, stuff like this helps you also, but we need to get rolling. This has been episode number 11 of The Russian and the Freak. We will talk to you later in case no one told you yet today. You are fucking awesome, and you are fucking awesome. Actually, isn't that what Oprah does? She says, you and you and you and you, and she does that. So now we're doing some Oprah bullshit. You are fucking awesome, and this camera down here, you are fucking awesome. We got to roll. No excuses. No excuses. Load up. This is the Russian and the Freak episode.